this is the history of a double loss, the loss of um, the environments that were um, not tracked and uh, disappeared from the art history, but also the history of women artists and their contribution, their contribution to the environments, but also to art, more importantly. Basically, they were experimental artworks and they were uh, produced just for the occasion and mostly they were destroyed. Not only this, uh, environments are very difficult to document because whatever you do, it's always partial because what is, what is the center of the environment is, uh, you know, the, the spectator, is the experience that you do. Uh, and so, uh, basically, when you want to work on an environment, you need a, a, a total, you know, a complex set of sources. With my colleague Marina Pugliese, who is a specialist, we started putting on a table um, about 300 images, cutouts from environments um, of any kind, of any provenance. And we immediately realized that there was a, a predominance of environments in Latin America, uh, particularly in Argentina, in Italy, in France, and obviously the one in the US we are familiar with. And then we started accumulating books and making more research and something was striking. What was striking was this sort of path of environment made by women artists. They were all different. They were extremely ambitious. They were um, ambitious in terms of size and ambitious in terms of forms. And they were um, game changing, so to say. They changed really the game of what the idea of art was. We began working together. I perfectly remember I envisioned this moment in uh, his uh, living room here in Munich, uh, where we began collecting images. And, uh, and then basically it stood out in a, in a very evident way, like women contribution was uh, outstanding and totally under-recognized. So we, st we stared at each other and we thought, how about uh, we just focus on women? These artworks also didn't make it in the history because they were made by women, because they were not simple to document, but because, and that's I think is very important, it's even more important than made by women, because they're dramatically transformative, transformative of canons. And the reason why I'm so uh, blessed that we work in this building is that we have the mission to not only reconsider the canons, but also to transform them and move forward. When um, we um, locate uh, a work that uh, we consider relevant, game-changing and transformative, like for instance the one I'm next to in this moment, Spectral Passage from um, Alexander Kazuba that was um, presented in San Francisco in 1975, the first thing we do, we go down the primary sources. The primary sources are all the sources available related to when the environment was made. Could be uh, interviews by the artist, could be photographs, could be um, newspaper, could be magazines, could be sometimes also films. Um, and obviously, if the artist is alive, uh, the, 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 te the testimony, the, the words of the artist. There are three artists that have been deeply involved in the development of their work. Um, Marta Minuhin, Tanya Muro, and Judy Chicago. For different reasons, the dialogue with them has been intense since um, um, 2021. With live artists, we decided with Andrea to basically um, let them do what they, they were wishing to do at the time, which was not possible. 
From Marta Minuhin, we had no sources. We couldn't find anything but photographs. So the only possibility was um, to see the, the artist and begin a conversation with her about how can we reconstruct this work. The artist was um, committed um, to, to the exhibition, which she really wanted to, to support because she thinks that she, she's been part of uh, that history, but she also thinks that the history we, we're trying to reconsider um, uh, is an history that is, this is fundamental. Well, basically, we're working on the foundations of a history because we are trying, you know, to change the paradigm and rewrite, uh, deconstruct and rewrite the prevalent narrative. So that's why this involved such a huge, such a humongous work of research. The next step will be to critically read the artwork, you know, with different perspectives. It might be, you know, social art history or gender studies or whatever. This is not what we did. Basically, we did, you know, the first job, like in our archaeological research, you know, when you first dig and find stuff and then somebody else enters and interpret basically the artworks that you find. So this is the first step. It's a, it's, I think it's a pretty big one and it will, you know, we will, we are offering it to the next generations to work on. Basically, everybody gets out of the exhibition joyful. This is the feedback we are receiving, okay? So it is definitely a transformative uh, exhibition. It's an exhibition which basically puts the spectator at the center. Uh, it enhances your senses because it's an exhibition which is about, you know, textures, it's about smells, it's about movement. You are engaged, you have, you know, to uh, basically overcome obstacles such as in Ligia Clark, uh, the dark, uh, such as in uh, Laura Grisi, strong light, uh, such as in so it is so different, so diverse. The, the public at House of Kunst is the material we, we want to engage the most. And um, the public is what makes an institution alive and what makes our, 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 our mission becoming a reality. You know? and, and I am particularly keen on uh, transforming the spaces and, and in uh, finding other forms of display and display that are very much uh, driven on the idea of bodily perception or immersion and not so much reading but stimulating all senses. So it was a um, marvelous journey for us to witness the first visitors entering, entering the exhibition. Inevitably every environment requires a sort of uh, transformation in the body, produces a transformation in the bodies but also requires a transformation. So we we have to move within them differently. We can be very quiet, we can be tempted to, to touch something, we can be tempted to take some feathers and uh, pull them up in the air, we can dive in them. This is um, all possible. The, the environments have a, a sort of affordance. I call it affordance as if they were musical instruments. Um, you are um, uh, curious to touch what is this flexible, very soft material, but you wouldn't rip it, you wouldn't like trying to, to, to go through it. So, and this is how they were made, and the sort of ephemera, ephemeral condition and the fact that they are all different instruments to be performed differently is what makes them so singular and so, and so beautiful. So, um, in, in one sentence, when I saw the audience uh, running or moving around the exhibition, I saw a wonderful concert that uh, took place and everyone was um, uh, with their body playing these uh, beautiful 12 instruments. Mm -hmm.